Um, but butterflies have always been Steve's passionate um, avocation. He has authored scientific and popular articles about butterflies and has led countless public butterfly talks and walks throughout New Mexico. His popular book, Butterfly Landscapes of New Mexico, was published in 2009. Then in 2020, Steve finally created his ultimate book, Butterflies of New Mexico, an online generously illustrated volume hosted by the uh, Pajarito Environmental Education Center in Los Alamos. Still New Mexico's butterfly guy, he remains actively engaged in traveling, hiking, writing, and butterfly photography and conservation. And we are absolutely thrilled to have him here today to give this presentation. Thank you so much, Steve. Well, thanks, Debbie. That's, uh, uh, that's a whole lot to live up to. I hope you guys forget most of that. Um, but it's an honor to be here uh, kicking off this whole series. Uh, what a great topic for, um, for the kind of coverage you're giving it. Um, and we're talking about butterflies today, but uh, pollinators and pollinator habitat are a huge uh, multifaceted topic. And I'm sure other presentations are gonna cover a lot of great stuff. Um, I've never done one of these Zoom presentations before, so be prepared for uh, uh, weird things to happen. I know I'm ready. Um, we're just going to go ahead and kick off the program here, and uh, I think you'll have a chance to uh, type in your questions, and we'll try to stop periodically and answer a couple so we don't get too far behind on the questions. Okay. Uh, New Mexico's beautiful butterflies and what's behind the beauty, and I am going to focus on Northeast New Mexico species, at least uh, in terms of illustrations. Okay, and that's me. Um, oh, first, uh, that's a juniper hair streak there uh, on all of our junipers around the state. And uh, yeah, we're just gonna get going here. So here's my plan. Um, six general topics, uh, where butterflies fit and what our species are generally. We'll have to, we have to talk about life cycles since that's so key to all insects and butterflies are no exception. Uh, life cycle, uh, the life cycle details have consequences for butterfly ecology. They have consequences for butterfly geography. Um, we'll talk a little bit about butterflies as pollinators. And then I want to wrap up by encouraging everybody to uh, not just go out and observe and participate uh, in uh, butterfly activities, but to get engaged in citizen science and get your data out there where people can see it and use it. OK. <clears throat> That's the plan. We'll see if I can hold to the plan. I think most of you probably know insects rule the world. Um, mostly we don't see them. Um, and for most of them, that's probably a good thing because the ones we can see, humans don't really uh, treat very well. Um, and butterflies are very different. Butterflies are very friendly insects. People are not intimidated by them. They're not threatened by them. Um, they appeal to our aesthetics, at least the adults do, the adult butterflies, that is. And um, if you look back through history and even in current times, butterflies and their very mysterious uh, metamorphosis uh, have held a lot of spiritual value for a lot of cultures. I like to think of them as ambassadors to humanity from the world of invertebrates. Um, because they are so presentable, so to speak. Uh, and it's great to think of them that way, but it's also important not to lose sight of what it is they represent. Uh, we need all the invertebrates that are out there, not just the pretty ones. So in New Mexico, we have a very diverse butterfly fauna um, exceeded among the states only by Texas and Arizona. We have more than 300 species. Uh, Probably 250 of those are actual resident species. The rest of them just wander in from time to time. And I'll just kind of go through and show you some typical photos here uh, representing the six families that we have. And everybody knows the swallowtails because they're big and bright and beautiful. Uh, black swallowtail in the upper right is uh, pretty statewide. And the two-tailed tiger in the lower left also almost statewide and probably uh, of, you know, from uh, Clayton to Las Vegas, 
uh, everybody can see those. I think I've actually heard uh, a couple of two-tailed swallowtail sightings in Albuquerque already this year. The second family has got a few more species in it, and these are all the kind of uh, quarter or half dollar sized uh, whites and sulfurs. And some of those are pretty routine species. They're, some of them are agricultural pests, like the orange sulfur in the lower left corner. Their caterpillars eat all legumes, including alfalfa. So if you want to see a lot of them, uh, drive by the alfalfa fields in, uh, in August, and they will, clouds of them can fly up. Uh, in the upper right is another very widespread butterfly in New Mexico, a checkered white. And that's just kind of a common roadside weed, uh, flying weed, as I like to say. Uh, but one of the more specialized whites uh, in northeastern New Mexico is in the lower right there. That's the Olympia marble. And uh, it's kind of a Great Plains butterfly that just gets into uh, the, our, New Mexico's northeast quadrant. And I think this weekend, I'm gonna go out and see if I can't find some and get some upgraded photos. This is just a grungy old photo from 1988, a slide. Um, okay, the third family in, we call the gossamer wings. That includes the uh, hair streaks, like the great uh, purple hair streak in the lower left. It includes the coppers, uh, which is that orange, iridescent orange thing uh, in the lower right. That's the ruddy copper find up um, south of Angel Fire. And then uh, in the upper right is Rekert's blue. A lot of the blues are pretty routine species and that is a kind of a statewide butterfly as well. This is my favorite group. Uh, they're all small, you know, fingernail size, maybe a little larger, but the details are so spectacular when you look at, look at them up close that uh, um, I really love them. Great photographic subjects. Fourth family is the metal marks. There's only a few species in that family and you really have to work hard to find those. Uh, this is the Sonoran metal mark, which uh, uh, you can find up near Raton. And we have a very large family of very familiar butterflies. The brushfoot family includes things like the painted lady, the monarch. Um, lower left is the variegated fritillary, which is uh, very widespread around the Southwest. On the right side is the Red Admiral, which is almost a worldwide butterfly. Uh, top center is the Buckeye, which is becoming more routine in New Mexico as, uh, as things warm up a little bit. All these butterflies have uh, in the brushfoot family, you'll recognize them if you get a chance to get a good look at them because they only have four functioning legs. Most insects as adults have six. And technically, uh, these guys have six as well, but the two front legs just don't work. They're kind of vestigial, and uh, I call them T-Rex four legs because uh, they just kind of don't do anything. So that's the brushfoot group. And our last group is our largest group, the skippers. Um, it's unfortunate they always come last, but they're probably the least beautiful of all of our butterflies. Most of them are gray or brown or subtle colors. Uh, lower left is a very widespread uh, species, the common checkered skipper. And then upper right is, uh, we have a group of skippers, uh, the giant skippers, and all of those guys, uh, their life cycle is based on either yuccas or agaves, and they, um, they bore, larvae bore into the roots and stems, and that's where they do all their eating. And so they're a very classic southwestern group that's well represented in northeastern New Mexico. And then the, the golden butterfly, kind of bottom center there, is one of my favorite butterflies to go to northeast New Mexico to see, and that's the Delaware skipper. And they love thistles, including, well, as you can see on that picture there. So any questions that we can uh, deal with right now? How do you tell the difference between a moth and a butterfly? Oh, excellent question. Um, well, moths and butterflies are really very similar, and most of their differences are related to the fact that some of them inhabit the night and, the, and some inhabit the day, uh, daylight hours. Um, if you're looking to, if you have something in your hand, uh, or you have a photograph and you're trying to decide if it's a moth or a butterfly, 
you look at the antennas. Butterflies always have a knob at the end of their antennas. And if that's what you see on your specimen, then it's a butterfly. Moths have much more interesting antennas. Uh, some of them are feathery, some of them are uh, slender filaments, some of them are stiff rods. Uh, there's a lot more going on in moth antennas, but they never have knobs on the end. So that's how you tell them apart. The other qualities that we typically attribute are uh, used to differentiate moths from butterflies. Um, you know, moths are kind of dark and uncolorful. They're often fuzzy. Uh, their, their flight is usually pretty erratic. Um, they don't see very well. Uh, they're not very pretty to look at. All those things uh, are true most of the time because they fly at night. And at night, the main predators for moths are, you can probably guess what they are. They are bats. And if you're trying to dodge bats all the time, you don't want to be brightly colored. You don't want to fly in regular patterns. Uh, you don't want hard edges. You want everything to be fuzzy. You fly in random patterns and you survive to mate. Um, and you find your own mates with scent rather than, uh, I, rather than eyesight. Butterflies are daytime creatures. They have excellent vision. Um, they usually, they fly like they know what they're doing. Um, uh, what else can I say about them? Um, yeah, so they're very, very similar. Some, some experts would argue there really isn't any difference at all except just kind of their habits uh, generate all the differences. Uh, what else? One, another question before I move on here? Yeah, Steve, um, we have another question here and it might be a, a broad question, but um, it is, are there distinguishing shapes, sizes that can help you ID proof? Oh, sure. Yeah, uh, well, we just went through six groups. Thank you, John. We just went through six groups, right? Swallowtails are big and bold and they often have tails. Uh, their size is almost enough to distinguish them. Uh, the sulfurs and the whites are, you know, about the size of a, of a quarter or a half dollar and they're very bright. They, they always look bigger than the, because they're so bright. You see one up close and you realize, oh, it's not that big after all. All the gossamer wings are small, like thumbnail, fingernail size. Um, metal marks are the same. Um, you won't see those very often. The brushfoots are very diverse. Uh, they have usually brightly colored, a lot of orange and black, um, small to large. It's a huge group, almost 100 species, so it's hard to generalize about them. And the same is true of the skippers, although most of them are kind of moth-like in appearance. And uh, they have, most of them have a kind of a distinguishing flight that's different from the other butterflies. So once you get to know them a little bit, um, yes, you can pretty quickly put them in one of those groups. Okay, I'm gonna continue. Uh, and I guess maybe in response to, uh, to that question uh, and to what's gonna follow, I just heard a really clever phrase uh, just a couple of days ago and I thought I would put a slide in saying it's, you know, butterflies are a complicated group. It's unwise to generalize. And the fact that it rhymes is kind of a bonus. So here I kind of summarize how they vary. Um, people like to, like to ask, well, what, are, what do butterflies do about this? Or uh, what do butterfly, are butterflies good pollinators? You can't really answer the question like you can't answer a question that's that general because they're small to big, colorful to dull. Um, some are garden pests, other ones are very rare and very specialized. Hopefully we can talk some about that as we go on here. Okay. And in order to talk about uh, butterfly biology or any insect biology, you first have to come to grips with the fact that they have life cycles that are different from human life cycles or mammals or birds. Um, and biologists look at two kind of standard uh, strategies for reproduction. Uh, the first one is uh, you bear very few young, but you take really good care of them so they survive to reproduce. That would be your dogs and your cats and your humans. Um, and then the other strategy is to bear, uh, have many offspring, but you don't give them any help whatsoever. Um, and insects are in that category. They're hyperabundant, uh, but very few of those hundreds and thousands and millions uh, survive to reproduce. 
And so that strategy um, plays out uh, for butterflies like this. Um, lower left, you see an adult uh, fulvia checker spot. I have fond memories of in wet springs of driving east of Las Vegas and having the prairie be just scarlet with all the Indian paintbrush out there. And fulvia checker spot, that's their plant. Okay. Uh, after mating, the female goes around and puts eggs. Uh, in the upper left there, you can see uh, most butterflies just put eggs one at a time, but some will put them uh, bunches together. So Sylvia checker spot females will put a couple of dozen eggs on the underside of the leaves of Indian paintbrush. That's their plant. Okay, uh, caterpillars hatch, they eat the eggshell, and then they rec say they see, oh, this is this is food here. So then they, they start eating. So top center, you see a bunch of gregarious larvae, pretty small, maybe um, a third of an inch to half inch long. Um, they eat, they grow. Uh, some of them get eaten. Um, a few survive. Uh, and then to the right, you see kind of a full grown caterpillar. Um, lots of spiky things to keep away parasitic flies and wasps. And then uh, the last, after the last caterpillar stage comes the uh, chrysalis, which is the pupil stage. And that's where uh, the metamorphosis takes place. And I'll just kind of provide a little bit of detail on each of these here uh, in a minute. Yeah, so this, this life cycle, as complex as it is, um, I like to think of it as uh, it generates all these different life forms that, you know, between the caterpillar and the adult that have many roles and many, function, many functions in ecosystems. They contribute to complexity. Complexity contributes to stability and durability, and that is a good thing. Um, we like our ecosystems and we want to keep them. And so compl complex life cycles contribute to that. Okay, so here's a quick, here's the egg. You know, maybe a millimeter in diameter for many species. Female will glue each one to a plant, hatches in just a few days. Um, every female in general has about 300 eggs to put around. And it takes her a few days to do that. And remember, for each species, they have a very specific menu of plants and females will find their plant using their sense of, of, of uh, chemical detection. The, the knobs on the antennas are have olfactory detectors and even the bottoms of their feet. And they're standing on a plant and they can tell if it's the right plant or not. And the right plant will usually trigger placement of an egg. Okay, out of eggs you get caterpillars and their job in the life cycle is to eat and grow, eat and poop and grow and repeat. Uh, they have mandibles and so they're chomping solid food. Uh, they go through several stages. Each stage is called an instar. Uh, member insects have their skeletons on the outside, and so you can only grow so much per stage, and you need a new skin. Um, once you get a new skin, then you can eat and grow and fill that one, and then uh, until you're done being a caterpillar anymore. Caterpillars don't move around very fast. Uh, they don't, um, so they have very primitive legs. And I guess the last bullet I have here is that. They're really just food ready for somebody to eat. So a lot of their appearance and their behaviors are designed to not get eaten. And it doesn't work most of the time. After the caterpillar fills its last caterpillar skin, uh, the next skin it creates is uh, the chrysalis. And there's a chrysalis on the right of a different butterfly. That's the question mark butterfly. Um, but I put it in there because it's, uh, it shows you they're stationary. They're usually well camouflaged because they don't move. And if you're discovered by a hungry creature, that's, uh, that's it. Um, most butterflies stay in the chrysalis. I mean, the chrysalis lasts only a couple of weeks and it's in there that uh, the butterfly, this caterpillar, this creature goes through adolescence and they transform from being um, eating and growing and more or less an asexual entity to uh, being a reproductive entity um, that has wings, can fly. Uh, instead of eating solid food, butterfly adults have a straw proboscis through which they can only siphon liquids. Um, 
and the adults are only around for a few weeks. They have a very specific job to do and they do it. And then, then it's time for the caterpillars again. Um, okay, so life cycle questions. Someone asked if the knobs on the antenna have a function. Yeah, they're, they're olfactory. They are the sense of smell is located in the antennal knobs. And then another one is, um, in New Mexico, do we have caterpillars that we shouldn't touch? I think that's true for moths, yes. Uh, some moths, uh, and again, caterpillars are just, uh, they're just bird food out there waiting to get gobbled. And so uh, there are some defenses uh, that are, that have evolved in, in uh, caterpillars that are pretty effective. And one, for some moths, they have, uh, you know, irritating um, hairs on them. Now, I don't know of any butterflies that have that, at least not in New Mexico. Some of them have other pokey things and other extravagant devices that are more designed to repel parasitic wasps and parasitic flies. But I don't think if, yeah, but of course, if you have a caterpillar, you don't know if it's a moth or a butterfly, right? So hairy, but hairy caterpillars are always moths. Just, so if you see a hairy caterpillar, don't touch it. It can crawl on you, that's probably okay, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't grab it. Anything so we, we, it looks like we're getting a lot of great questions here. Good, good. Um, and so I have this one that's talking about what to plant. So if I were to plant one variety of a flowering plant or a host plant, what would you recommend? I'm at 7,000 feet southeast of Santa Fe. Um, well, there are a lot of ways to, that's a great question. And I really appreciate the intentions behind it. I think if you know the, the host plant is what we call what the caterpillar eats, and for you know adults, adults are pretty uh, are pretty uh, opportunistic. They'll get nectar wherever they can. Caterpillars are they kind of have to eat whatever mom put on the menu, uh, and so for uh, southeast of Santa Fe at seven thousand feet, um, you know there are a lot of grasses at that elevation. Um, some people are, are planting milkweeds to try to be host plant for monarchs. I always encourage that. There are a lot of great native milkweeds that you can get at our native plant nurseries, things like showy milkweed or horsetail milkweed. Um, if you are in juniper country, which is quite possible at 7,000 feet southeast of Santa Fe, then um, junipers are a good, thing, good plant to plant because the juniper hair streak, remember that on the first slide? Juniper hair streaks, uh, their caterpillars will eat that. Um, let me think here. What else is good? Um, well, uh, Indian paintbrush is a good one. We just saw Fulvia checker spot caterpillars munching on that. Those are some examples. Great, thanks. And okay. then we have another question um, that's how many cycles can they go through in one year? Well, good question, and that varies. Again, you can't generalize, right? So for each species, it's their own thing. Uh, some butterflies just do one a year because their host plant for the caterpillar is really only nutritious for a brief period during the year. Um, other butterflies um, that have good healthy host plant for much of the summer, they might go through their life cycle two or three times. Painted Lady will do that if conditions are good, which they're not this year yet they can go through their life cycle three times. Um, yeah, and the one I'm showing you in this current picture is the Taxiles skipper, which is kind of a, a mountain riparian butterfly. And they just fly once per year. They have uh, uh, in June and July, that's when the adults are around and they mate and lay eggs. And then the rest of the year, they're slowly going through the other stages. Thank you. Um, and I think the last question for now, um, there's a monarch question, but we can save that maybe for later. Um, okay. And then we're wondering if you could explain in greater detail how the antenna knobs and feet work. How the antenna knobs do what? How, how the antenna knobs and feet work, how they work. So just 
Could you go into more detail? Um, well, the antennal knobs just have sensors in them. Uh, they have uh, you know, chemical detectors. Uh, they don't really, they're not manipulated really. I think they can, you know, they can move the antennas as a whole a little bit and you'll sometimes see them do that. Uh, but the knobs themselves are just kind of attached and <clears throat> they go where the, where the butterfly goes. And I wasn't sure what the second part was you were asking about, John. Can you repeat that? Was it the proboscis? Um, it was uh, the, the, feet. the knob and feet. Yeah, the, the feet. feet. Yeah, the feet. Again, they just have uh, scent detectors on the feet. And um, for, for females, you understand why they would want to know uh, if they're on the right plant or not. And I can't really tell, you know, I'm the anatomical details beyond uh, what you can see in a camera. I, I can't really help you much with that. But those are excellent questions. And there are, I'm sure, lots of details you can learn more about. Great, thank you. Sure. Okay, moving on here. Um, so within this life cycle, again, I just kind of highlight the fact that the larvae are the ones that are driving the boat uh, for most butterflies. And they have, um, they play really two really important roles in ecosystems. They are the ones that are converting plant protein to animal protein, uh, which is a really important thing for ecosystems. And they are the ones that are interacting with the plants that they're eating, confronting the plants chemical and physical defenses. Um, so uh, that's what herbivores do. And uh, so, so butterflies are herbivores when they are caterpillars. And uh, caterpillars, as I mentioned before, they are really food just waiting to be eaten. Um, I mentioned parasitic flies and wasps. Every once in a while, you'll come across a caterpillar that's uh, in, when you're out in nature, you'll find a caterpillar just kind of out in the open and it's got little tiny little chrysalises or cocoons on it. And you know that that's been parasitized by a fly or a wasp. And uh, if you can see a caterpillar, that's not a good sign for the caterpillar. If they've been seen by you, then other things have probably seen it as well. And then a few years ago when I worked for Audubon, I had this uh, 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 an, aha, an aha moment, uh, which is that uh, migratory birds basically raise their young on Lepidoptera larvae. And you think about all the different migratory bird species that come to New Mexico uh, to raise, you know, raise their young. And those birds, I'm telling you, they just kind of are scouting their nest site, you know, like you would do if you're moving to a new town with your young kids, you look around for, you know, all the necessities of life and migratory birds preparing a nest do the same thing. And they usually like to make their nest where they can see there's lots of larvae around, mostly moths, of course, since there are way more moths than butterflies. And they can even time their nest so that the, the larvae that they're seeing out there in, in the vegetation is, you know, approaching the plumpest stage of their development. So that was kind of a mind blower for me. Um, caterpillars are really just food chain fodder. Um, and somewhere down the line here, I have a question for you guys. So um, about that. Okay, and this, this concept about uh, caterpillars kind of driving the boat is what drove me to write my butterflies, Butterfly Landscapes of New Mexico book. It's, uh, it was fun. It's a fun book. Uh, New Mexico Magazine published it for me and that's, I'll always be grateful to them for that. Let's see. Hey, Steve, we, we had one question. Um, Fire away. That kind of was a little bit before what you're speaking before. It's, are male, female born in equal numbers? And how do they find each other to mate? I would say generally, yes, they are in generally equal numbers. But finding each other is uh, definitely uh, a necessity. And they each species, again, has kind of its own strategy for uh, narrowing down the world. Um, and finding a mate. Uh, if you think about humans, we have our mate location strategies too, right? Um, I don't, I'm not saying who goes to bars or who goes to churches, uh, but there are definitely, you know, behaviors that humans engage in when they're looking for mates. And butterflies do the same thing. Uh, some of them just hang around the host plant. And that's, uh, that's where you want to be. Um, 
you know, after mating, the female just needs to put eggs on the host plant anyway, so that just simplifies things. Other ones will go to the tops of hills, and that's kind of how they're built. They just keep flying up and up and up until there's no more up, and you go to hilltops to see those species. And other ones, I guess the third dominant mechanism is they will wander down to the low spot in the landscape, and that's usually a drainage, an arroyo, uh, you know, a river bank, something like that. And then they'll patrol, males will patrol back and forth, uh, watching for females. And uh, it's kind of fun to be out when you see butterflies doing that because it's, uh, well, you just understand what they're doing. Excellent questions, you guys, keep them coming. Okay, I'm gonna move on here just to highlight this idea of uh, caterpillars uh, and host plants being so important. And since we're in Northeast New Mexico, I wanna talk about one particular plant that's so important for uh, human life and lots of life on, on our short grass prairies, and that is blue grandma grass. And here on this page, I have, on this slide, I have four different species of skippers and their life cycles are all based on caterpillars eating blue grandma grass. Uh, upper left is the green skipper, upper right is uncus skipper, lower right is uh, the simius roadside skipper, and lower left is uh, the rhesus skipper. And they all kind of look like they belong in the grasses, and in fact they do. Um, and if you, I have one more slide that's, uh, there's like eight different species of butterflies in New Mexico that if you want to see them, you have to go into the Tall grass prairie where the blue grandma grass is the dominant, uh, dominant grass. Uh, and if you, uh, you know, take a step back and think about other dominant plant communities in the state, the same is true for them. Ponderosa pines have three species of butterflies. That, that's their plant. Uh, aspen have uh, three species. Wetlands have their particular plants and their particular species. Gamble oak is an important most plant for half a dozen species of butterflies. So when you see, when you get the connection between butterflies and their host plants, the landscape starts making a lot more sense. Okay, uh, here, let's see. And this complex ecology uh, that applies to caterpillars also applies to adults. Um, and here I have a, I guess I won't be able to make that change in the slide. Typo there, sorry, typo alert. So what about adult butterflies? Those are the ones we see all the time. And uh, when we, we go looking for butterflies, that's what I look for. I know there are people out there who are out looking for caterpillars, but that's a whole different mindset and I don't have that mindset. Adult butterflies, they also are prey. So regardless of the life cycle stage, there are things looking to eat butterflies. In the picture, I have a praying mantis that has grabbed a, um, a Lita mini streak as it flew by. I wish I could have seen that happen. Um, but there are spiders, there are birds, ambush bugs, assassin bugs, ants, lizards, robber flies, all are out there looking for insects to eat and mostly flying insects. Uh, so um, here in this, in this slide, I'm showing you a painted lady butterfly that's been nabbed on this milkweed inflorescence. I don't know if you can see the ambush, you see the ambush bug in there? That's their strategy is they climb up into a flower inflorescence and they hide and wait for a pollinating insect to come along and then they have their hair trigger uh, front legs, uh, grabs them and then they inject a, um, a paralyzing liquid and paralyzing dissolving liquid and suck out the insides. So we've talked a, lot, talked a lot about predation on butterflies, whether caterpillars or adults. And so now I have, your, have this question for you guys. Each female is out there putting 300 eggs out. And if all those eggs represent contributions, DNA contributions of one male and one female, how many of those 300 eggs are gonna survive to reproduce, assuming a stable population? can't hear you, so you have to, I don't know how we're going to do that. Think about that. Let's see. We have uh, five, ten, two, three, a lot of, a lot of twos or threes. 
surviving. Someone yeah. said 30, so about 10 percent. Yeah. Well, I think the answer is two. Since you started with two butterflies, one male and one female, in order for a stable population, you just need to get two back. And so that means uh, 298 of those 300 on average don't make it. Uh, they get gobbled as an egg, as a caterpillar, a chrysalis, or as an adult. So that's, that's the, the strategy B, is you sacrifice most of your offspring or just enough survive to reproduce. Upper left is a robber fly that's grabbed a uh, southwestern orange tip. The orange tips are flying now, by the way. And on the right is a west coast lady that's been grabbed by a crab spider. Flowers, uh, if you're planting flowers out there, just be prepared for an ecosystem to take over. Uh, all kinds of things happen on flower, flower heads. Okay, well, one of the things that happens uh, is something that adult butterflies do, and we talked about caterpillars munching, chewing, and digesting solid plant material, but adult butterflies are only drinking liquids, siphoning liquids wherever they can, mostly from flowers, and they need uh, flower nectar for uh, just to feed themselves, to power their flight, and to maintain their health for mating. Here's a couple of marine blues. I think that's uh, Joe Pie weed or something like that. And so butterflies and flowers, they go together. Um, and butterflies are there for the nectar. Um, and because they're visiting, they're visiting flowers, you can say that they are pollinators. Or are they? I'm just going to pose that question and start the process of answering that and again. It's unwise to generalize. But there is one good generalization, and that is that butterflies have absolutely no interest in pollen. Uh, they can't eat it, they can't feed it to their offspring, uh, it will clog the proboscis. And so saying they have no interest is probably even a bit mild. They really want to stay away from it. What butterflies want is the nectar. And in some cases, you could probably even consider butterflies to be nectar thieves. Um, really, yeah, the ones with long legs kind of stay away from the flower and get the proboscis into the tube. I'm not sure there's much pollination going on there, but again, uh, we have to get more specific. And, and in the world of pollination, a lot of the decisions are made by the plants. The plants choose their pollinators or have chosen them through their evolution and natural selection of their size, their shape, their color, uh, the time they bloom, the scent, and various other characteristics of the flowers will determine who comes to pollinate. And of course, in fact, are engineered kind of in tandem with pollinators uh, iteratively to uh, some, some solution that works for both. Um, so here is Milbert's tortoise shell, a nice uh, one of our great mountain butterflies uh, sitting on a cone flower of some kind. Um, good shot of the antennal knobs. And uh, some plants actually, you know, say plants choose their pollinators and some plants choose butterflies as their pollinators. And you can tell if a plant has chosen butterflies to be their pollinators, they typically have these qualities. They're very colorful, often pink or lavender. Uh, butterflies can't hover in front of a flower while they're extracting nectar, so they need a place to stand or land. And uh, composite flowers are good examples of, of, a, of a flower that will provide a place for butterflies to land and stand. They're off, often scented, uh, plenty of nectar, sometimes more nectar than pollen. And then uh, those flowers, uh, butterfly flowers typically have very simple nectar guides and nectar is often hidden in a tube. And why a tube? Well, the butterfly's proboscis is basically a tube um, and it fits nicely inside of a larger tube. Butterflies with a long proboscis will struggle sometimes to get the end of their proboscis in just the right place if the flower is not a, a nice tubular flower with a funnel at the top. Okay, so some plants choose butterflies as their pollinators. And here's a couple of examples from 
northeastern New Mexico. Um, our native bee balm is just a spectacular flower. And uh, that is a butterfly pollinated plant. Here you can see a taxoese skipper. Um, and you can see the proboscis kind of uh, uh, worming its way down into the flower tube there. Um, and you know, in order to do that, the skippers typically have a very long proboscis, often as long or longer than the body. Uh, other butterflies often have a shorter proboscis. So, so the butterflies have qualities that connect them to certain plants and not to others. Uh, second psychophilus or butterfly pollinated plant is a very special one, the Holy Ghost Ipomopsis from up in the Pecos. And uh, the flower you can see, it's kind of pink. Uh, it's got a lot of pink tubes. And here is a um, snow's skipper. And you can see the proboscis kind of working its way into the tube. Uh, this is one of New Mexico's rarest, one of New Mexico's rarest plants. And I don't know why it's rare, uh, whether maybe choosing butterflies as the pollinators uh, wasn't the best choice. Uh, sometimes you'll see swallowtails, because they have a pretty long proboscis, you see swallowtails coming to these. But mostly it's uh, snow skipper and the taxoe skipper that are pollinating these flowers. Okay, so um, our butterflies as pollinators, it's really hard to generalize. They certainly visit a lot of flowers. Most, almost every species will come to flowers, um, but a flower visit does not equal pollination, right? Um, and I guess my own sense is uh, small fuzzy butterflies with short proboscis can be effective. Here on the right side of this slide, you can see a very small skipper, Garita skipper, and you can see the proboscis reaching inside the flower. And it's just, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure any pollination is happening there, any pollen transfer. But here, if you look at the gray hair streak, which is a, a very routine butterfly in New Mexico, this is a cut leaf coneflower, a great, uh, if you have water, they like a little damper. They're kind of a, a streamside flower in our mountains, <clears throat> seven to 8,000 feet. Uh, cut leaf cone flower, and um, you can see the structure of the flower. It's got uh, the petals, the ray flowers around the edge, the big, large yellow petals, and up from them are these uh, pollen bearing stamens. And here is a gray hair streak. It's kind of working its way around the flower, dipping its proboscis into each one of those. Most of them aren't open yet, just the two or three rows around the bottom of the, of the cone are open. And uh, it's dipping its proboscis in, trying to get the nectar out of each flower. And you can start. You can see a little bit of yellow on the um, on the body. And if I zoom in a little bit on the photograph, uh, you can see that there's pollen on this butterfly. There's pollen on the legs. There's pollen on the face. There's pollen on the bottom of the thorax. There's pollen at the base of the wings. And so it seems pretty clear to me that uh, this butterfly is moving pollen around for this plant. It's totally incidental to the butterfly's life. It, you know, it, it rather it would rather not have the pollen, but um, you know, and some insects actually can clean themselves in between flower visits, and, and insects that do that are not going to move a lot of pollen. But butterflies can't do that, at least to my knowledge. I've never seen that. So someone's asked um, yeah. if flowers aren't getting much pollination service from butterflies, why are they choosing uh, butterflies or most to attract them, butterflies? Most of them don't, in my opinion. Um, most pollinate, most uh, bees are probably the most effective pollinators because they're actually working with the pollen. Um, I would say these, that's a good question and I, I I think the answer is that most plants don't choose butterflies as their pollinators. I showed two examples, um, but other ones are, you know, other flowers might be more general, choose generalist pollinators and have a variety of possible creatures that can come along. And cone flowers like this one here are good examples of that. You see lots of things on cone flowers. There'll be flies, there'll be beetles uh, moving pollen around. Um, and so, uh, and there are other butterflies um, 
here's a good example. Here's another coneflower, uh, and here's a black swallowtail. And you know, I think the butterfly can get in, get the nectar, and get out without moving much pollen. Uh, so um, just have to look at each species on its own. And I think, as I said before, I think the small fuzzy butterflies are doing some pollinating. And uh, the, fl of the flowers that have chosen butterflies as their pollinators, they've figured that out. And, and many flowers don't choose butterflies as their pollinators. And to the extent that they have nectar, it's probably for bees, because bees need nectar as well. But butterflies might come along and, and uh, get some of that nectar anyway. It's complicated. That's what's so fun. Other pollination questions? Uh, one person asked about the proboscis and if it retracts. Yes, it does. And I don't know if I have a picture in here of a retracted proboscis. Let's see. It basically coils up under, you know, there's a little slot between the, well, it's kind of, there's no chin really, but let me see if I have a picture that shows it. Maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah, it's blocked there. Those are all actively working the flowers. I don't, but yes, it coils up kind of like a, uh, what do you call those party favors, the little blow things that uncoil. Does coil up and get out of the way. Yes. And then uh, this is kind of going back a little before pollination, but there were a couple of sure. comments about uh, population. And so if only you know, only two eggs are making it um, yeah. and butterflies are getting eaten, how do they maintain a stable popula population? Well, they maintain a stable population by producing hundreds of offspring each. And, and it's, uh, I think I think that's kind of the strategy is you make 300 you, you have 300 eggs on the chance that two will survive and you know most you know the population for example of filvia checker spots in northeastern or northeastern New Mexico there's millions of them out there and each one is putting out 300 eggs if they all survived we'd be overrun in a couple of years it would be filvia checker spots we'd be inhaling them and so it's kind of this bargain I guess that gets struck between the ecosystem and the, and the insects is uh, um, we're going to make lots of offspring and the ecosystem says, well, we'll eat most of them for you. And, uh, and it all, you get food chains, you get food webs and you, you know, there's just kind of stability in the complexity, but yeah, a lot of things get eaten, but not, not all of everything gets eaten, hopefully. Another question on that line is, um, how have butterflies and moth, or, or, so have our butterflies and moth populations following similar declines, kind of like our bees are, or are, are they doing better than bees? Or do we know, I guess is the other. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, yes is the answer to all those questions. Um, yeah, I think, I think we don't know. I think uh, there's a lot more study going on of bees because they're so important for agriculture. Um, you know, every, I think it has to be approached on a species specific basis and there are just too darn many of them for them all to get studied. We have 300 butterflies in New Mexico and my moth buddies suggest uh, probably uh, 30,000 moth species. Uh, they're just tremendously diverse. And um, <clears throat> I think certainly uh, any habitat that's converted to human habitat, you know, the butterflies and moths are largely gone from those areas. Um, and it's just, uh, we're trying to monitor. And, you know, it's one of the things we can do as citizens is participate in citizen science and help track some of these species so we can start answering those questions. Um, 
you know, in the past, it was always the main issues were habitat loss. Uh, and now we have climate change kind of overlaying everything and uh, habitat is being changed and altered for lots of other reasons now uh, because of that. And so um, each species is gonna have its own response. And for uh, herbivore creatures like butterflies, a lot of their ability to survive or not is gonna depend on the fate of their plant or their little menu of plants, whatever it is. And uh, how are those plants doing? Um, are they, you know, kind of our wacky um, late spring, mid-May deep freezes? What's that doing? And our extended drought. Uh, I do know that a lot of our plants and herbivore, you know, uh, insects have pretty good resistance to drought. They've been through it before, but how much will be too much? So I'd encourage everybody to um, you know, get engaged and maybe it's picking a butterfly or picking a location and just kind of keeping an eye on things. Um, you know, statewide, it's a lot. Uh, and that's always kind of been my, my focus, New Mexico. And um, there's just too much going on in too many places for any one person to be able to have a grip on, on everything. But each person who's participating today in the presentation Maybe they can go to their backyard or to their trail they hike regularly and uh, keep an eye on, on a particular group of plants. And that segues nicely to um, kind of the final lap of my program today, which is encourage everybody to get involved. There's lots of ways to do that. Uh, the North American Butterfly Association has been doing 4th of July counts probably for 30 or 40 years. They produce a nice butterfly gardening magazine. That's a tremendous way for people to, in their own property or on their business, whatever it is, a backyard, or uh, maybe it's a um, exhibit at a wildlife refuge, uh, get some native plants out there. And um, without using any, uh, any biocides, try to get some um, insects to come and visit, uh, butterflies, for example. And NABA also operates the National Butterfly Center down in the Rio Lower Rio Grande Valley of Texas. Uh, the Lepidoptera Society has lots of uh, research uh, products, a lot of people doing a lot of stuff. Um, you just kind of scroll down here, probably a lot of you are involved with iNaturalist. It's just one example of an online citizen science venue where every, we all can be taking photos with our phone, uploading data and helping to map uh, the occurrence of various, uh, various organisms, plants, animals, butterflies. I haven't done that yet with iNaturalist, but I plan to just because it's becoming so easy to do. Then you can go log on and see who else is finding what you're finding, or it can identify your butterfly for you. Um, so I really encourage people to do that. Um, you know, the old days, uh, being a you know, an, an expert, uh, it, was, it was a lot harder to do, but really a lot of people can become proficient just with using uh, tools that are in everybody's pocket, which is really great. Uh, there's another website called Butterflies and Moths of North America, and that is an attempt, uh, North American attempt to collect and share data about butterflies and moths. Um, gives you a chance to submit your photos, get IDs, and um, each state has its own reviewers, and I'm the butterfly reviewer for New Mexico, so I really encourage people to get your photos uploaded there. I love seeing what everybody else is seeing. Uh, most people are getting pretty good at identifications, um, but I'm always happy to help guide people where there's difficulty, um, and they're at uh, butterfliesandmoths.org. Bamona is for short, Butterflies and Moths of North America. Uh, what else do I have here? Oh, uh, Debbie in the introduction mentioned that my uh, Butterflies of New Mexico project is online now. And it's basically an online book. So it's a little bit clunky. It's not interactive, but um, I do have a blog and people can you know comment on blog posts. And so it gives a chance for uh, people to um, tell me what they're seeing or whether they love or hate hate the project and uh, all that stuff is really good. I really love hearing from people. Um, 
it's full of full of uh, images, and uh, it started out as being a way for me to get my images online so people could see them rather than just sitting in my files. Uh, but a lot of people are taking a lot of great butterfly photos. Uh, it's getting easier and easier to do that, and so I try to I try to share the forum, share the canvas, if you will, and. Uh, if you submit images, I'll try really hard to get them up uh, if they're reasonably good quality. What else? Oh, here's something that just started this year, the New Mexico Butterfly Monitoring Network. Uh, you can, that's a, I think if you just search on that, you can, you can get in touch with Anna Walker, who's based at the, uh, in Albuquerque at the zoo, the biopark. They're trying to set up uh, transects all over the state where people are going to uh, do her type of uh, monitoring. And um, she's got a really great program going. And I encourage, every, you know, if you want, if you kind of walk the same trail repeatedly, a great chance to make observations and have them count toward a better understanding of butterflies and our ecosystems. We haven't even talked about monarchs yet. Um, and I know my time is up here, but uh, monarchs are a whole world under themselves. Um, we've had three reported from New Mexico. They're just kind of making their way into our state from, from Mexico. Um, but there's so much you can do. And I really encourage you to look into it, especially Northeastern New Mexico. Uh, lots of milkweeds. So there's breeding that goes on in the summertime. Um, most of the monarchs in the US are in the Eastern part of the country. Uh, and that really means East of the front range of the Rockies. So that includes Las Vegas, it includes Clayton, it includes Raton, it includes Clovis and Portales and uh, Roy and all uh, and Mora and all those places. And so we contribute, you know, New Mexico contributes to the Eastern Monarch population. Um, I don't think we contribute hugely, we're just too dry, but we contribute some. And I think it's really important for our contributions to be better understood. So if you see a Monarch, Log into uh, Journey North. I think that's the first blue bullet there, journeynorth.org. They've been monitoring migratory creatures for decades and they have a tremendously great website. You can kind of watch the migrations as they're happening uh, with data points as they're coming in. There's a Southwest Monarch study based in Phoenix. You can submit your data there. There's an app, there's an app uh, for iPhones, for monarch observations, you, and on your property, you can do stuff for monarchs. Plant milkweeds, plant. They really need nectar for the, in the spring migrants coming north and for the fall migrants heading south. That's almost always where things kind of run short for us in New Mexico because it's usually dry. And so if you can plant a bunch of sunflowers or a bunch of uh, chamisa um, or a bunch of milkweeds uh, and keep them wet until you know, until the monarch season is over, that would be great. Uh, this spring, it's been so dry. Uh, see dandelions over in Portales, that's where monarchs were getting their nectar from. And then along the Rio Grande by Las Cruces, they were getting nectar from the blooming willows on the, on the riverbank. So um, a lot of ways people can participate. I think we're approaching the end. Oh. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we have we have a lot of questions still. Oh, sorry, we're running out of time. Oh, no. I'll last as long as you guys have as long as you can stay on. I'm happy to. Ask. Okay. Um, I will ask a few of those. Um, before that, I am going to put a survey in the link um, from us. So we would appreciate feedback from everyone who's attending to help us with our programming and. We also have seeds that we can give you. You don't have to fill out the survey to get the seeds, but we will need your address. So I'll put that in there. And then let's go through a, a few. Um, here's kind of what I thinking of, my, of butterfly conservation on a small scale. How effective is planting butterfly backyard habitat in helping butterfly populations? Really good question. I think it depends on where you live. <clears throat> If you live in the middle of downtown Albuquerque, probably not much. Uh, you kind of have to be semi-connected to some natural habitat. So if you're in rural New Mexico, it'll be very helpful. Uh, if, um, if you're surrounded by asphalt and concrete, then probably not. Of course, there's a lot of in gray area in between. And um, 
So if you're in a neighborhood where there's a lot of backyards with some native vegetation, um, then probably it can be helpful. Uh, the one thing that uh, does happen usually in late summer is that some things will wander through and monarchs are included in that. Uh, but also coming up from the south, there'll be some subtropical species that just kind of caught the air currents wrong um, and to find themselves in New Mexico when there's really no hope for them to reproduce or survive the winter. <clears throat> so, um, so it's good to have some nectar for them. But again, I think the closer you are to some green, uh, the better. And if you're close to green and water, uh, even, even more better and streams more than lakes, I guess. Open water doesn't really have anything for butterflies, but stream banks, um, that, that kind of thing does. Here's kind of going on a different track, but what are your thoughts on uh, raising butterflies? And I'm not sure if this is uh, more the commercial raising or when, I guess, or both, and when people bring caterpillars in or eggs. Uh, I think, you know, for uh, families and kids to have the opportunity to bring a caterpillar in from their backyard and um, rear it up to an adult, I think that's priceless. And I encourage that. Uh, that's the priceless experience of, of growing up, uh, connecting with another organism and something that's so different from us. Uh, we all need to encourage that. Um, and there's other extremes too. Uh, at, the, at the other end, I think uh, it's a little risky um, any farmer knows there's diseases out there that can affect their crop and that can be true for large scale raising of butterflies as well and we don't want, um, you know, we don't want diseases, funguses and stuff to go from your backyard out into nature. Um, I think it just has to be done with care uh, on, a, on a modest scale. I think, um, I think that's the way to do it. I know there's been some educational programs that focus on rearing uh, painted lady butterflies, for example, and perhaps now monarchs. And I would just, you know, the hand, hands-on experience of interacting, you know, with a butterfly at that level is has extreme value for you know, you know, students or whoever uh, who's engaged in that. But there is a, there is a risk at the other end um, that something might go amiss. So I would just be aware of it and be smart about what you do. Uh, this is for going way back to life cycle, but how do butterflies overwinter? Oh, that's a really good question. And uh, oh, is it unwise to generalize? Oh, yeah. Um, each species has its own plan, basically. And I'm just going to scroll back up very clumsily here to the uh, fulvia checker spot life cycle. <clears throat> um, you know, in general, any one of these life stages can pass the winter. Uh, the key thing for each species is for its eggs to be getting, being put on the plant when the plant is the most nutritious and the happiest and the most luscious and nutritious. If your plant is like if you're, um, if you are a, uh, a southwestern orange tip, your plants are native mustards and they are going right now, they bloom early, uh, they senesce early, and so butterfly adults are out there very early mating and putting eggs on those plants. They're out there right now. Actually, I saw some this morning putting eggs on their mustards because uh, they got to get their, those caterpillars have a month before the mustard senesce. Uh, and then they're in diapause the rest of the year after they've, after they've made their chrysalis. Um, so in the other things you'll see out there, if you go out now into the into the you know low mountain foothills, you'll see morning cloaks and you'll see angle wings and commas and tortoise shells, and they all overwintered as adults. Um, and so they're out looking for mates now. It's less critical. Uh, well, I guess it's it is critical for them too um, to get their eggs out on the willows. The willows are coming into bloom and they're kind of feeling a surge of growth. Other butterflies. Um, will overwinter, other species will overwinter as an egg. Some will overwinter as a partially grown caterpillar and others will overwinter as a chrysalis. So it really all depends on what the plant is that, that the butterfly is utilizing. Uh, 
Um, are there, do, I guess, so I'll, does your book have host plants? And then can you also offer resources for people who are interested in learning more about which host plants, but different butterflies use? Um, the best uh, for New Mexico anyway. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Uh, my, you know, my book isn't the best for that. Uh, can I hold something up to the screen and will people oh. be able to see it? Yes. Um, most most butterfly field guides. Can people see this? Oh, this is it backwards? No, it's the right way. Uh, it's Jeff Glassberg's book. Um, I don't know if people see it or not, but uh, can I stop? Can I stop the screen share? Yes, then they can see it. Okay. So anyway. Uh, all these books talk about host plants for each butterfly species. So this is a good one. Uh, Jeff Glassberg's Swift Guide to Butterflies of North America. Um, here's another one. Jim Brock's Butterflies of North America. He talks about host plants and he's based in Tucson. And so he knows Southwestern butterflies. For New Mexico specific stuff, uh, go to Butterflies of New Mexico at the PEAK website. And I list host plants that are known in there for each species. Um, yeah, so that's what I would do. Um, that's the way to get that information. Let's see. And if you have, um, a specific, have a specific butterfly, I might know offhand. I'm scrolling back through the comments now. Yeah. Just see what we. Can you hold that first book up again, please? You betcha. I'm not sure what's what the right <laughs> position is for you. I also posted a link in the comment section to that first book um, on the Princeton side. John, are you seeing yeah. any questions that I've missed? Yeah, I, I'm, <laughs> I've been trying to look through the questions. So if you already asked this one, I'm sorry, but I, I see one here, leptodotrins use pheromones for anything. Do, do leptodotrins use pheromones for anything? Yeah, leptodotrins do have produced pheromones and they're really important for moths. Uh, in the moth world, that's how males find females. And it's the females that puts out the pheromones and you may have heard some legendary stories about the male of the species being able to detect, you know, one molecule at a distance of two miles or something. Um, that's why um, moth males have such elaborate antennas is because they are radar dishes hoping to connect with a pheromone molecule from a female and then, of course, fly upwind and you'll find the female. Um, so that's how it is for moths. They're very pheromone oriented. Uh, butterflies are less pheromone oriented, but they do use them to some extent, some species more than others. And in butterflies, it's the males that produce the pheromones. And uh, like on the hair streak butterflies, if you ever get a chance to see the wings open, you'll see actually the skippers too. There's a little patch of scales. Let's see if I can, let's see if I have a picture I can show you. I don't know if this is going to work or not here. Um, well, let's just let's just pretend. On this skipper over here, lower left, can everybody see that checker skipper? Yes. A patch of scales right here. And let's just say it's not this patch, but let's just say it is. And that has specialized scales in it that have uh, chemistry associated with them. And the butterfly, every time they flap the wings, a couple of scales go out. And um, so that's how males will distribute their scent. And uh, as they're flying around patrolling, looking for females, the females will follow the scent to them. And I know if we go to the end here, uh, we can talk about monarchs, they have a, uh, my yeah, maybe my monarch's picture isn't the best for that, but um, 
<laughs> oh, I must have hit the wrong button. Anyway, yeah, so it's males that put out the scent and the females that, that find it. But remember, butterflies also have their eyes. And for most butterflies, I would say their eyes are the most important mate location um, uh, tool. The scent is secondary, whereas for moths, it's primary. Great. Um, there's still still a few questions I think out there. Yeah, um, go ahead. And I think these two questions are sort of related, so I'll go with this. Um, and please, in the comments, if I'm getting the point of your question wrong here, let me know. But I think the main point of this question was, um, what would you plant um, to see more butterflies? Um, because they're saying that some host plants you only see larvae, you know, and so maybe that's not for seeing. Um, butterflies, and I think they're also yeah. saying that some butterflies don't really hang around where you can see them visibly. Um, so which ones would you suggest if you want to see butterflies? Well, I think, um, of course, you can't have a caterpillar on a plant unless the female was there to put an egg for That might have been a very brief visit. Um, I would say, you know, the best, it depends on uh, where does this person live? Can we get that information? Or is that? Uh... Um, if you want to type that in the chat, um, I typed the question. I'm not sure who asked that question. Um, I would, if the I would, I would say on, and they want to. For generally, I would I would say in uh, in northeastern New Mexico, uh, mountains to plains. Um, if you uh, get a chance to walk around and see what butterflies are visiting you want in your yard. Um, and I would include most plants that are in the composite family. Uh, cone flowers are very good. Um, blanket flower, firewheel, the gallardias are very good because they have lots of flowers, lots of, lots of nectar tubes in the middle, and then a, a nice little platform for them to stand on. Um, fleabane is a smaller version of that. Uh, those are all good. Uh, you almost can't go wrong with composites. Um, then I would say um, a lot of the skippers will go for tubular purple flowers, which often are legumes, um, vetches, and things like that. Uh, the bee balm we mentioned earlier is a good butterfly plant. Um, awesome, thank you. I don't know. Uh, I can't, I was going to go back to my share the screen again because we could look at every slide and see what the butterfly was on. Um, but um, swallowtails like like to come to uh, tubular red flowers, kind of like pumpkins do. So if you have a, um, like a um, some of the red flowered penstemons that go for the hummingbirds go for, uh, swallowtails will come to those. Those are some examples. I'm going to probably butcher this name, but someone asked about the APACA family. No carrot family, sure. <laughs> is, is that a good one for butterflies? I would say yes, it is. <laughs> I would say so because they have a nice, uh, a nice umbel, a nice inflorescence that's easy for butterflies to stand on. And if you go, you know, walking in the uh, kind of the stream uh, water courses, Around Wagon Mound and Raton and Las Vegas and up into the into the up into the mountains, you'll see lots of things like water parsnip and um, poison hemlock. Those are all in that family, um, and they're off. They often have butterflies on the flowers. Yep, and black swallowtails will put eggs on those plants too. And really, I guess that's another perk of using the citizen science. Um, like iNaturalist and the but the mo butterflies and moths of North America with those pictures is that you can see what flowers butterflies are on. So that would be a good place for people to go look and see. Right, very true. If they can identify the flower. I mean, uh, you know, I don't have a way to illustrate it, but um, there's kind of a handy tool that maybe some of your one of your one or more of your subsequent speakers will show you, which is the. Uh, the pollinator syndrome chart. Oh, yeah. Um, 
you know, there's some flowers, some, some flowers are not trying to appeal to butterflies. They're trying to appeal to bees or to flies or to hummingbirds. And uh, they just, you know, the uh, a snapdragon shaped flower, that's not a butterfly flower. They're, those are designed for bees. Um, and uh, that's kind of a handy, if you search on pollinator syndrome chart, you can kind of see it's obviously an overgeneralization and we know it's not wise to generalize, but it gives you an idea of what kinds of flowers, if you look, you know, will be general direction for you to head in terms of what pollinators you want to um, uh, appeal to. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of great resources out there. Um, yeah, a, lot of, a lot of good resources. Yeah, it's just, I guess it's just picking, picking your favorite. Almost. <laughs> it's, com it's complicated. <laughs> it, it kind of is, yeah. It kind of. I is. will. Um, I have been writing some of the the links and resources you've suggested down so that I can email those to to people. Um, I have saved the chat so we can uh, email people with any extra questions. We can go through that and see it uh, if we missed any. But I just want to thank you for your time today. Been oh, great. My pleasure. Thank you. It was a lot of a lot, fun. Thank you. A lot thank of thank you. yous in the comments as well. Good. Good. Anytime. Good luck with the rest of your talks. Thank you. Thanks for starting us out. It's a, it's a good way to, to start. Awesome. I was going to see if the speakers wanted to stay for just a few minutes or the speaker and the hosts want to stay for a few minutes. We can sure. debrief. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you, everyone. All right. Amanda, you want me to stop the recording? Oh, yes, please. Sure. Oh, I can.